was filming this freaking video and talking about a book I barely liked. So today, I am reviewing for you lovely people, The Hazelwood by Melissa Albert. You know, the first few times I said this, I can't remember her name for the love of God. Now her name is like imprinted inside my- Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to do my Terry Pratchett book tour. Now, perhaps understandably, I, I can't hold all these up. I managed to do it with my Goosebumps books video, which I'll link to below. But these, there are a lot of books, as you probably saw from that little intro clip. But I'm going to take you through them all anyway. Just before I get started, I need to check my stats, you see. So the R.L. Stein video that I did, I think that was 49 or 50 books. And according to Goodreads, Terry Pratchett is my most read author with 59. And let me know if you want me to do any more of these tours and I might just continue going down this most read authors list. So in at number three with 37 books is Graham Greene. Stephen King then with 36. Charles Bukowski, 33. Agatha Christie, 31. Then we have Ian Fleming and Colin Dexter tied in 7th with 16 apiece. Arthur Conan Doyle with 15. And then Roald Dahl and Seth Godin with 14 in 10th place. Basically, let me know if you want to see my tours for any of those authors and books and we will do them. Now, I'm going to try and do this in alphabetical order, but it's really going to be quite difficult because I have four stacks of these books and really I want to keep them in alphabetical order so I can just put them back on my shelves and I have to sort through them all so we're gonna try and pick up stack one right now wish me luck <laughs> Christ oh god I have to straddle thing oh oh so here are the first what's this this is about 10 maybe 11 books so we'll start with these ones so and I'm not going to go into huge detail about all of these books because I don't want this video to be super long. But I am going to give you my own personal highlights as when we get to them and whatnot. So we'll start with A Hat Full of Sky. And this is a Tiffany Aching book. It's the second book about Tiffany and the We Free Men. And uh, yeah, I quite like the We Free Men books. And then we have Carpe Jugulum, which is a Latin phrase. If you translate that, it means go for the throat. This is the 23rd Discworld novel, but the first to star vampires. And mightily Oates has not picked a good time to be a priest. He thought he'd come to Lankra for a simple ceremony. Now he's caught up in a war between vampires and witches. Some of these I read years ago. This one isn't even a Discworld book. This is Diggers. This is the sequel to Truckers, which is one of the Gnomes books. And uh, it, that's basically like a fantasy trilogy that's a bit like... It's, it reminds me a bit of The Borrowers, except it's with little gnomes. So here they are. They are literally in a digger. I don't know whether I don't know whether you'd call it a digger in America. What would you call that? I don't know. Let me know with a comment. Is that still a digger in America, or would you, would you call it something else? And we have Dodger. So this is quite a recent one, and I feel like this. Yeah, this is uh, this isn't Discworld either. This is. I'll, I'll read you at the top. It says Dodger is a tosher, a sewer scavenger living in the squalor of Dickensian in London. Everybody who everyone who is nobody knows him. Anyone who is anybody doesn't. And, um, yeah, this was quite a fun one, actually. So this one functions as a standalone. And if you're into, like, Victorian stuff and, like, steampunk and all that kind of stuff, you probably quite enjoy this one. I should point out as well, all of these books, I have read all of these books. That's why he's my most read author. Then we have Equal Rights, which is one of the first Discworld books. It doesn't actually say on the back which one. I think it's number three or four. So this is book number three. And this is... What's cool about this, actually? This is published... First published in... Let us see. Hey Google, when was Equal Rights first published? 19... On the website history.com, they say, first proposed by the National Women's Political Party in 1923, the Equal Rights Amendment was to provide for the legal equality of the sexes and prohibit discrimination on the basis of sex. To read more, look for the link in your Google Home app. Sometimes the voice changes, which is weird. So Equal Rights, published in 1987. I found it on the inside flap. We're fine. So before I was born. I think it's the eighth son of an eighth son becomes a wizard. And uh, in this case, the eighth son of an eighth son actually turns out to be a female. And she wants to be a wizard. And uh, everyone knows there's no such thing as a female wizard. But now it's gone and happened. And there's nothing much anyone can do about it. So this is a great little book. It's got witches in it, which is good, but equally, it has, like, sexism and commentary on that, which is great. And obviously what Pratchett himself is best at is making a commentary on the real world, you know. Then we have Eric, which this one is one I've mentioned to Miriam from Between Lines and Life before, because this is a take on the Faust story, follows Eric. Eric is the Discworld's only demonology hacker. Pity he's not very good at it. 
So Eric tries to summon a devil and uh, basically gets some get some wishes. He says, nothing fancy to be immortal, rule the world, have the most beautiful woman in the world, fall madly in love with him, the usual stuff. But unfortunately, instead of summoning up a demon, he accidentally summons Rincewind. And uh, yeah, then they go through a ride through space and time. And this is noteworthy for being by far the thinnest of the Discworld novels. Aha, feet of clay. This is one of the ones that really made me fall in love with the series. This is a Sam Vimes City Watch, Ankh-Morpork City Watch novel. And uh, well, here we go. Let me read the start of it. There's a werewolf with pre lunar tension in Ankh-Morpork, and a dwarf with attitude, and a golem who's begun to think for himself. But for Commander Vimes, head of Ankh-Morpork City Watch, that's only the start. Now, the great thing about the Discord is you can literally pretty much start with any book. They all kind of function as standalones. There are series within these series, as you'll notice as I go through all of these. And, um,. Feet of Clay, I would say, is definitely a good one to start with. Any of the Ankh Morporks that you want, watch ones, really. Those are my, my favourite by far. And Sam Vimes and Lord Veterinari as well are two of my favourite literary characters. Then we have Good Omens, which is by Terry Pratchett and Neil Gaiman. And actually, unfortunately, I didn't like this book very much. And it kind of put me off Neil Gaiman for a while. Blurb here. It's quite a short one, so I'll just read it to you. According to the nice and accurate prophecies of Agnes Nutter, the world's only totally reliable guide to the future, the world will end on a Saturday. Next Saturday, in fact, just after tea. Then we have one I actually only hauled this one recently. This is Going Postal, and this is a Moist Von Lipwig story. And Moist Von Lipwig is basically like a former con man who ends up in, like, positions of power. So in Going Postal, he ends up running Ankh Morpork's postal system. And, again, what's great about it is that Pratchett's just so good at like mirroring the real world and just some of the things like the post office's motto is great and they go through this backlog of letters then they get this like some quite touching moments when people receive letters that have been held up in the postal service for like 40 odd years and stuff then we have guards guards and this is another one of the ankh Pork city watch novels this is a fairly early one it's probably i don't know book 11 or 12 something like that oh it's the eighth Discworld novel it says guards guards is the eighth Discworld novel and after this dragons will never be the same again if you want dragons in a city with like a cult kind of organizing all of these dragon attacks, this book is for you. And then last in this little pile, because for obvious reasons the next one wouldn't really plop on top of this pile, we have Hogfather. And this is Pratchett's take on Christmas. So we see throughout her Pratchett's Discworld books that there are such things as small gods. Basically, if enough people believe in a god, that god will just pop into existence and this is actually a story of what happens when the Hogfather disappears and obviously without the Hogfather there can be no Hogsmas, no Hogswatch, sorry. Yeah this is a good one to read around Christmas and again you can read this as a standalone if you are new to Pratchett's work. I personally, I think I read it in like August, you can read it year round. All right, I'm going in on number two of four. Oh god. This one I cannot lift up in one go, there's no way. All right so next up we have Terry Pratchett's Hogfather, the illustrated screenplay by Vadim Jean, mucked about with by Terry Pratchett. And uh, it's a bit knackered because it's been on my shelves for a while, but it's all the screenplay of the adaptation, some stills in it, that kind of thing. Basically, a few of the Discworld novels have been adapted into, I guess you'd call them almost made for TV, made for TV movies. And this is literally the script of the Hogfather version of that with uh, illustrations and stuff. Pratchett himself, look, you can see him there in that middle photo. He made his own appearance in the in the movie as a toy maker. Okay, then we have I Shall Wear Midnight, which is a Tiffany Aching novel. Not too much to add to this one, really. I would say, actually, it took me a while to get into this mini-series, but then once I did get into it, I did start to really like Tiffany Aching as a character, and I think it's about in this book where the tides changed for me. It says, uh, Somewhere, sometime, there's a tangled ball of evil and spite, of hatred and malice that has woken up. And it's waking up all the old stories too, stories about evil old witches. A terrific Discworld tale filled with Terry Pratchett's inimitable blend of wit, insight and magical storytelling. Then we have Interesting Times, which is a Rincewind novel. This is actually set in the Agatean Empire, I believe, which is the oldest and most inscrutable empire on the Discworld. Basically, it goes into revolution brought about by this revolutionary treatise called uh, What I Did on My Holidays. And basically, this guy went to Ankh-Morpork from this like sheltered 
civilization that's kind of based on China, really, China's feudal system. And he goes back and just tells people what's out there beyond the wall, and it causes this revolution to happen. And Rincewind is along for the ride for this. We get Cohen the Barbarian and his uh, silver horde of old elderly barbarians as well. It's just a cracking book. And um, the title of this comes from the urban legend that there's an old Chinese curse which is may you live in interesting times and uh, Rincewind doesn't want to live in interesting times he just want to wants to chill with his uh, wizard hat with two Z's on it and we have Jingo Jingo is basically about the Discworld goes to war Commander Sam Vimes of the Ankh-Morpork City Watch finds himself being kind of sent out unfortunately he's also uh, his grace the Duke Sir Samuel Vimes so um, he finds himself being sent out basically to where this war is about to break out um, as like a diplomat but he's the least diplomatic person ever so it's very interesting this one's kind of a tale of global intrigue I believe the, the premise here is that like this lost island a bit like Atlantis rises up from the sea and so obviously everybody stakes a claim to it and uh, yeah it just follows the the crazy crazy things that happen after that and we have this is a little hardback this is Johnny and the bomb so Johnny and the bomb is um, Another little mini trilogy that he wrote, and I guess they're more for young adults. So if you're a young adult reader, definitely check out. Check out specifically only you should, uh, only you can save mankind, which I'll get to in a bit. But basically, Johnny Maxwell is this teenage kid, and is he goes around with his friends in our in our world rather than the uh, as opposed to the disc world, and they have little adventures. And in this one, I believe it's to do with the Second World War as well. So that's a nice little added bonus. Okay, next up we have Johnny and the Dead, which is another one of the uh, Johnny Johnny books, I suppose. So it says here, not many people can see the dead. Not many would want to. 12-year-old Johnny Maxwell can, and he's got bad news for them. The council wants to sell the cemetery as a building site, but the dead have learned a thing or two from Johnny. They're not going to take it lying down, especially since it's Halloween tomorrow. And th this was excellent. All of the Johnny books are excellent, and actually... They're underrated. You don't see them talked about much because most people talk about the uh, Discworld books. And th that's a really fine trilogy and I, I definitely recommend it. We have Lords and Ladies, which is uh, another Granny Weatherwax witches book. So they were in equal rights as well. The blurb here is the fairies are back, but this time they don't just want your teeth. Granny Weatherwax and her tiny coven are up against real elves. It's midsummer night. No time for dreaming. With full support and cast of dwarfs, wizards, trolls, morris dancers and one orangutan, and lots of hey nonny nonny and blood all over the place. And I must admit, it's been a fair old while since I read this, so I'm not even going to comment on it. Making money, this is Moist Von Lipwig again. In this book, he has gone from the post office to managing Ankh Morpork's uh, City Mint. So this one's here celebrating 25 years of Discworld. This is probably a like book 40 odd or something. And again, it's great. I really like the Moist Von Lipwig books because he's. He's this like lovable rogue of a con man who you hate to love and love to hate, I guess. This is Masquerade, and this is another one of the early ones. I can't really remember what this one's about. This copy is so old, it says Terry Pratchett is 47 and lives in the West Country. Yeah, it's set in Ankh Morpork's Opera House, it's got the witches. That's all you need to know. And then we have Men at Arms, which is all about the Ankh Morpork City Watch and them actually expanding. So it includes the introduction of Corporal Carrot, who is a fantastic character. We get Lance Constable Cuddy, a dwarf, Lance Constable Detritus, a troll, Lance Constable Angua, a woman, most of the time, she's a werewolf, and Corporal Nobbs, who got disqualified from the human race for shoving. And again, this is another great one. Any Ankh Morpork City Watch book is just fantastic. This one is all about, they have uh, 24 hours to clean up the town, and this is Ankh Morpork we're talking about. It's like the dirtiest town in existence. Okay, next up we have Mort, and this is one of the death novels. Basically, in this book, Death gets an apprentice called Mort, short for Mortimer, but obviously it's got a late little death connotation there. And uh, the blurb here is, Death comes to us all. When he came to Mort, he offered him a job. And I would say this is probably one of the finest Discord novels. It's very early. It's number four, I think. Yeah, number four. And this is probably one of my favourites. I definitely recommend more. Especially if you like death as a character. Which, let's face it, how can you not? We have moving pictures. The idea is pretty simple here. It's that the Discworld's equivalent of Hollywood happens. So the alchemists of the Discworld have discovered the magic of the silver screen. But what is the dark secret of Hollywood Hill? And there are plenty of, you know, nods here to popular films. Well, well like classic films, really. Um, so if you're a film buff, this is definitely one for you. Then we have Nanny Og's cookbook. So Nanny Og is one of the witches from the witches novels. And this is literally as it sounds. It's a cookbook. It's got some really nice illustrations in it. And the idea is that you can go in and, uh, yeah, cook yourself at various different things. And it also has like 
her thoughts on all sorts of stuff like, you know, the meaning of trolldom and all this stuff. Then we have Nation. Now, Nation is another standalone, and this is uh, the, the blurb here. On the day the world ends, Mao is on his way home from the boy's island. Soon he will be a man. And then the wave comes. And after that, the village is gone. The nation, as it was, has gone. Then we have Night Watch, which is another City Watch book. What's interesting about this, though, is that basically Vimes gets sent back into the past, and he he finds himself in his own past back when he was a young copper, and all this stuff happens. I believe in this, he ends up even training his younger self. It's been a while since I read it, but I remember it being fantastic. I mean, it's a City Watch book, but equally the way that it played with time travel was very good as well, and like you know, causality and all of that stuff that you normally see in sci-fi, not in fantasy, but Pratchett pulled it off really well. Then we have Only You Can Save Mankind, which is the Johnny Maxwell novel that I talked about. And in this one, basically Johnny Maxwell is playing games on his computer screen. He's blowing up aliens. And then they send him a message and basically ask him to stop. And it turns out all the aliens being blown up in his computer game are real aliens. And so he ends up trying to save them and, you know, to find them somewhere spa uh, safe and to stop people from playing this game and all that stuff. And uh, this, again, you can read this as a standalone if you want. It's fantastic. It's just a short little book. And I heartily recommend this one. This one's a 5 out of 5 easy. Reaper Man, which is a death novel again. I think in this one he has... A, yeah, death is presumed is missing, presumed uh, gone. So basically, it's almost like death has a midlife crisis. I think he gets a motorbike, doesn't he, at some point? He just decides to go and live his life. Meanwhile, on a little farm far, far away, a tall, dark stranger is turning out to be really good with a scythe. So yeah, if you like death, you'll like this. Pyramids. This is the Discord's take on ancient Egypt. And this fits in with the Assassin's Guild as well. Let me just read this aloud to you. So, being trained by the Assassin's Guild in Ankh-Morpork did not fit Tepic for the task assigned to him by fate. He inherited the throne of the Desert Kingdom of Jelly Baby rather earlier than he expected. His father wasn't too happy about it either. But that was only the beginning of his problems. So this is the seventh Discworld novel. So again, another early one. And if you're into Egypt and... Egyptian like legends and all that kind of stuff. You'll love it. There's some great stuff with the gods in this one as well. Raising Steam. Guess who is back again? It's bloody, uh, what's his name? Moise von Lipwig. And in this one, he teams up with this engineer called uh, Dick Simnel. Uh, the man with tut flat cap and tut slide and rule. And uh, basically, this guy learns how to harness the power of steam. So for the very first time, the Discworld gets steam trains and... Obviously, Moist von Lipwig is put in charge of making it happen. So this is Small Gods. This one here investigates the whole idea of gods coming to life in the disc purely because, you know, people believe in them. It's called anthropomorphic, anthropomorphic, anthropomorphic personification. That's what it's called. The blurb here. In the beginning was the word, and the word was, Hey, you! For Brutha, the novice, is the chosen one. He wants peace and justice and brotherly love. He also wants the Inquisition to stop torturing him now, please. You have Terry Pratchett's Snuff, which actually, I don't remember this one. Um, but this is all about, yeah, Commander Sam Vimes of the Ankh-Morpork City Watch goes on holiday. He's out of his jurisdiction, out of his depth, out of bacon sandwiches, occasionally snookered and out of his mind, but never out of guile. So this is, this happens in a few of the books that Sam Vimes has to go traveling away from the City Watch for some reason and ends up still investigating a little mystery. Soul Music, here is Death on a Motorbike and this is when uh, rock and roll comes to the disc I believe. Other children get given xylophones. Susan just has to ask her grandfather to take his vest off. Yes, there's a death in the family. It's hard to grow up normally when a grandfather rides a white horse and wields a scythe, especially when you have to take over the family business and everyone mistakes you for the tooth fairy. And especially when you have to face the new and addictive music that has entered Discworld. It's lawless. It changes people. It's called music with rocks in. It's got a beat and you can dance to it, but it's alive and it won't fade away. And we have sorcery. And this goes back to what I was telling you earlier about the eighth son of the eighth son becomes a wizard. And this is eighth son rather than seventh son, by the way, because on the Discworld, eight is the magic number. So the, uh, the you know, you have octagons are the lucky shapes and there's a an eighth color, the color of magic called octarine. And anyway, sorcery is about the eighth son of an eighth son of an eighth son. Now wizards usually don't have eight children, but this wizard did. And because he's the eighth son of an eighth son of an eighth son, He's not just a wizard, he's a sorcerer because he can tap into the source of magic. Then we have Strata, which is one of another one of Tratt's Pratchett's non-Discworld books. This is more sci-fi, so this is for you, Todd, if you're watching. Uh, the company builds planets, blah, 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 yeah. 
Discovering two of her employees have placed a fossilized plesiosaur in the wrong stratum, not to mention the fact that it is holding a placard which reads end nuclear testing now, doesn't dismay the woman who built a mountain range in the shape of her initials during her own high-spirited youth. First published in 1981, Strata is an early exploration of the idea that was to become the best-selling Discworld series. Then we have the amazing Morris and his educated rodents, so this is basically, I guess, a retelling of the Pied Piper of Hamelin. The amazing Morris is a cat, he's a talking cat, the rodents can all talk as well, and uh, yeah, it's fantastic. I mean, it says here, like, Morris is a streetwise tomcat with the perfect money-making scam. And they scam these towns by, the, the educated rodents go in and then Morris takes them out and they take their money with them. Then we have the Carpet People, which this was written by Terry Pratchett, age 17, and Terry Pratchett, age 43. So this is actually one of the first things he wrote when he was a kid, and then he came back and rewrote it. And it's basically about all these like people that live within our carpets, and they have their own sort of society down there, hence the Carpet People. Non-Discworld, I should point out, but fun nonetheless. The Colour of Magic by Terry Pratchett. Is this an early printing? This might be a really early printing. So this is 1986, this was printed in, with the first edition 83, so it says, The Colour of Magic, Jerome K. Jerome meets Lord of the Rings with a touch of Peter Pan, Terry Pratchett, The Colour of Magic. And this is obviously the first book, the one that introduces them all. It says, The wackiest and most original fantasy since Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's the first one. It's definitely more fantasy heavy than the others, but if you are a... Uh, you know, a, a hardcore fantasy fan, you will enjoy it still, you know. The Dark Side of the Sun, unparalleled science fiction from the author of the Discord novels, Terry Pratchett. And I don't remember this one at all. Then we have The Fifth Elephant. And what's great about this is this is another kind of political intrigue tale. This is set in Uberwald, I believe. And, uh, yeah, Sam Vimes is a man on the run. Yesterday he was a duke, a chief of police, and the ambassador to the mysterious fat rich country of Uberwald. What's great about this as well is it explores the legend of the fifth elephant. So the disc world, in case you didn't know, is a disc-shaped planet that's supported on the back of four giant elephants that stand on the shell of a turtle. And uh, if you've heard of John Green's Turtles All the Way Down, this is the same idea that went into that book, kind of went into the disc world series, but years before. And um, the idea, of course, being like, well, what's the turtle standing on? Well, it's turtles all the way down. But the uh, legend says that there was a fifth elephant and during the early days of the disc this came trumpeting through the sky and crashed into the ground and that's where all mineral deposits and iron and all that kind of stuff comes from. And speaking of folklore of the disc world, this is the folklore of the disc world. By the way, my arm's over there to hold this stack of books up, right? And this is Terry Pratchett and Jacqueline Simpson. And basically, this just goes into a lot of the different float folklore that the Discworld uses. It talks about how it relates to our own world. But it's very much like a reference book. And it's, I mean, it's just fascinating. You learn about our real world um, folklore as well as, the, as well as the folklore of the Discworld. Next up, we have The Lost Continent, which is set on the continent of Forex, which is equivalent to Australia. And yes, that is named after the beer, as far as I can tell. And... Um, this is Rincewind and the Luggage head off there. It's the 22nd in the series. And he says, it says down here, Terry Pratchett would like it to be known that The Last Continent is not a book about Australia. It's just vaguely Australian. So yeah, it's a good one to read if you're an Aussie, I guess. And we have The Last Hero, a Discworld fable, illustrated by Paul Kidby, who's done a lot of these illustrations. And uh, it's basically exactly as you might imagine it's an illustrated story. It's bloody massive as well. This is Cohen the Barbarian and his Barbarian Horde. Like I said, they are all older gentlemen. So yeah, this one's a lot of fun because it's a bit different to a lot of the others as well. The Light Fantastic. This is book number two in the entire Discord series and this follows Rincewind again. There's not much I can say about this because I did read them in pretty much in order. I read a few out of order and then started back from the beginning. So it's been a long time since I read that. Then we have The Science of Discworld by Terry Pratchett, Ian Stewart and Jack Cohen. We have The Science of the Discworld 2, The Globe by Terry Pratchett, Ian Stewart and Jack Cohen. And then we have The Science of the Discworld 3, Darwin's Watch by Terry Pratchett, Ian Stewart and Jack Cohen. And these books are all great because as they, they're the, they're the scientific equivalents of the folklore of the Discworld books. And yeah, you know, what's great about these actually is they also have 
stories from Pratchett within them. So it goes like one chapter is an original story from Pratchett and the next chapter explains all the science behind it. And it's just really well researched and all, all of these books are fantastic. And I believe there's a fourth one that I haven't read yet as well, but I'm getting there. All right, next up we have The Streets of Ankh-Morpork being a concise and possibly even accurate map of the great city of the Discworld devised by Stephen Briggs, assisted by Terry Pratchett. So this is cool because it folds out in two and this here on the left is like a little booklet and a you know it gives you a written introduction to the map project and gives you a guide of what all the symbols mean and all that stuff and then this bit here opens out and you get well looks i hate maps i hate them so much you get a map of the city of ankh Morpork, which is very cool and very difficult to, to put back away again. Then we have The Truth, and this follows a character called William de Word, who's kind of based on William Wordsworth, I guess, except what happens to him here is he actually founds the Discworld's first newspaper. This is the 25th Discworld novel, and it's just, it's kind of a game changer in terms of, I think this is one of the first Pratchett books where it witnesses the introduction of a modern, or a modern feeling technology. So you get the uh, newspaper here, later on you obviously get um, the clacks, the steam train, like all of this stuff. But um, I thought this was really cool, and it was interesting to see they get a, they get a, a guy called Otto van Schriek, I believe he's called, and he's a vampire iconographer, which basically means he's a photographer. The only problem is every time the bulb goes off, it turns into a pile of ash. So there are some great characters in that book, and I recommend it. Here we have the We Free Men, which is the first Tiffany Aching novel, and basically this this is about the Pixies, which are these like blue. Uh, like they're like little Scottish things and um, yeah they, they they use a lot of bad language to the the pixies but um, and they're very mischievous but they're kind of pretty funny characters as well and we have the unadulterated cat by Terry Pratchett and Grey Jolliffe and basically it's just about cats and so this is perfect for if you have um, if you have a cat of your own as like little illustrations and stuff um, non-fiction, I guess, but it's kind of a cute... It's a funny book about cats that Terry Pratchett wrote, basically. What more do you want? I should point out, these aren't even all of his books. I'm still missing about ten, maybe. But I'm getting there, slowly but surely. I don't want to buy the rest of his books too quickly now, because obviously there aren't going to be any more. This is Terry Pratchett, Alan Batley, and Bernard Pearson, the Unseen University cutout book. And basically, you can build your own 3D model of the Unseen University. However, I didn't do that. I uh, basically bought it, read through the, like the introductions and all that kind of stuff, and uh, yeah, and then just flicked through and looked at all the different pages. I, I wouldn't want to ruin the book by trying to make it, because I'm not very good at making things as well. Then we have Terry Pratchett presents Miss Felicity Beadle's The World of Pooh, a Discworld delight for real readers of all ages, and basically this is a copy of the children's book that Sam Vimes read to young Sam Vimes. So it's pretty cool because in the novels it was just mentioned as this book that Sam Vimes read to his kid. And it eventually actually became, uh, you know, a, a novel, a book of its own. And it's quite like in depth for considering like it's, it's kind of a parody children's book. It's like not a short book by any means. Has these nice little illustrations, but the print is tiny. Then we have Thief of Time, and this basically follows the idea that uh, I believe a, a clock is being made, but it, if the clock measures time too accurately, then time itself will cease to exist. We have Thud, and uh, this is another kind of political thing. Vimes ends up investigating the murder of a dwarf, but basically tensions are high between the dwarfs and the trolls and the humans. It does kind of play with race a bit in this book, but in like the Discworld's own way, bloody hell, the neighbor just slammed the door. Truckers, so this is a part of the Digger series. So again, little tiny dwarfy people. So politically incorrect, I can't say that. I think they're called gnomes. Unseen Academicals, this basically takes the Wizards of Unseen University and has them playing football. I can't remember why, but this is basically what happens when football comes to Ankh-Morpork. There's the librarian who plays in gold. Don't call him a monkey. Don't call no, don't call him a monkey. Then we have Wings, and this is the final title in the Gnome trilogy. And this is, well, as you can see, it's got a spaceship on the front. I don't know if you can see, it's not very in focus, but whatever, it's that kind of cover. And yeah, this just wraps up the series. I obviously don't want to say too much about this because I don't want to give you spoilers. And also, I don't really remember it. These are a lot of books to try and talk about just off the top of my head. And we have Wintersmith. And uh, this is another Tiffany Aching novel. Oh, this one I read quite recently as well. Basically, she jumps into a dance with like the spirit of winter and then she starts to be a little bit possessed by it. And this follows, you know, 
Unless she can work out how to deal with the wintersmith, there will never be another springtime. Which is abroad. It's about witches abroad. So, um, it seemed an easy job. After all, how difficult could it be to make sure that a servant girl doesn't marry a prince? But for the witches, Granny Weatherwax, Nanny Og, and Magrat Garlic, travelling to the distant city of Genua, things are never that simple. Servant girls have to marry the prince. That's what life is all about. You can't fight a happy ending, at least up until now. So again, what's cool about Pratchett is he quite often subverts these norms. And then finally we have Weird Sisters, which I believe is the one, it's the sixth novel in the Discworld sequence. I believe this is the one that introduces the witches. So it says here, Witches are not by nature gregarious, and they certainly don't have leaders. Granny Weatherwax was the most highly regarded of the leaders they didn't have. But even she found that meddling in royal politics was a lot more difficult than certain playwrights would have you believe. That was 59 Terry Pratchett books. I didn't want to go into all of them in too much detail. I'm a bit hot now, to be honest. I'm going to take a shower. I feel like I've cooked under me lights a bit. But anyway, thanks a lot for watching. Let me know if you've read any Terry Pratchett. And if so, let me know which of your favourite of his books are. And if not, let me know which of these takes your fancy. Which of the books that you've seen today you would like to read yourself. And in the meantime, please do hit subscribe if you haven't already. And I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.